All right. Been a minute. Soz. Brain drain and creative blocks and all that. How about we waste no more time though and do some talking about video games, what I have played and liked in 2022 for the first time. We'll keep this light and snappy and rattle through a bunch of good ones I reckon. No real ordering, although the last two are very much my favourite games of the year. Let's get on with it. First up, we're going to look at the first new game I did do a let's play of, that being The Gunk. Released right at the end of 2021, this game was developed by Image and Form Games, now known as Thunderful Group. These are the minds behind the excellent Steamworld games. The Gunk follows two space scavengers who land on a strange planet looking for something to sell and instead find a strange slime-like goop, or I guess gunk, covering the land. You play as Rani, who uses her high-tech cybernetic arm she calls Pumpkin to clear out the gunk and, in the process, restores the land's beauty and life. The game is all about progressing through this strange land, uncovering the mysteries of what happened to it, as Rani and her partner Beck begin to have a few conflicts over whether it's worth the effort. It is, obviously. The thing I really like about this game is that it didn't waste my time. It's a snappy 5-6 to six hours playthrough. It's got a unique premise and scratches an itch that I have that will come up later in the video, satisfying my predilection for cleaning things up in games. Combat is kept to a minimum, although there is a few major battle moments. The characters interact in a way that feels like genuine close friends going through some stuff in their relationship. Definitely give the game a look. Like I said, you can finish it in 6 or so hours and it's something quite unique. Plus it has loads of weird alien creatures to look at. Speaking of weird alien creatures... The Artful Escape was released in late 2021 on Xbox and PC and came to the other consoles early in 2022. It's developed by Beethoven and Dinosaur. Not the actual Beethoven, I assume. I also don't think a dinosaur coded it. Anyway, this here is a game all about the pursuit of creative freedom whilst being expected to live up to the legacy of a famous family member. In this game you play as Francis Vendetti, whose uncle was a moderately famous folk musician. He has come to his hometown and is expected to play folk music just like his uncle. Thing is, Francis likes things a little bit more cosmic. There's very little to this game in terms of structural gameplay. You hold a button down to rock out as you run through a stage and perform actions to enliven the world with the power of prog rock. Sometimes you'll get into a boss battle that involves a game of Simon that has enough wiggle room to allow you to jam out a few tasty riffs. The game is set against the backdrop of an intergalactic adventure to play the greatest concert in the galaxy, and with the end goal being to impress the ancient mythical space creature known as the Glamagon. If I had to describe what it feels like to play the Artful Escape, which is something I have to do here because that's the whole point of this video, I'd say it's like playing through a glam prog rock album with all the psychedelic imagery you'd expect to go along with it. The game's highs come as a result of running through incredible vistas whilst melting faces. Speaking of melting faces... You may have seen me play this a few weeks ago on the channel. This here is Metal Hellsinger, a game that asks what if the incredibly metal Doom 2016 was even more metal? In this game you blast your way through hellish demons to get your revenge on Satan for taking your voice while some proper heavy black metal blasts out. The big twist? You shoot in time to the music by tapping the trigger on the beat. Each gun has a rhythm that works alongside the drum beats controlling the tempo of your encounters. 
As you keep on the beat, a combo meter rises and the music starts adding extra layers until vocals from some of metal's current most growly vocalists kick in to give you that feeling of being ridiculously awesome as you tear creatures to pieces. This game, developed by a team known as The Outsiders, really hooked me once I got my head around the main mechanics. Granted I didn't quite manage that in my let's play, but I have got the hang of it more since. The game encourages you to replay levels with weapons and game modifiers you unlock as you progress through the stages of hell. There's a certain element of the game that feels familiar, as it's clearly influenced by Doom 2016, and visually reminds me of some parts of the Darksiders series. That familiarity may help ease you into its pretty unique rhythm action shooter mechanics, plus it's full of rad as heck heavy metal. Speaking of heavy metal... There's no need to really dwell on this game for too long. It was a pretty major release and as such has been discussed to death. What have I to add to the discourse? Not much. Just want to say that I really enjoyed Gran Turismo 7 after not enjoying an entry in the series that much since maybe the third one? I've also found Forza Motorsport series increasingly dull in recent years, hell I didn't even stick with Forza Horizon 5 for long. But Gran Turismo 7 held my attention a little bit more solidly and I can see myself returning to it some more. There's a feeling of a more guided experience that feels more welcoming to newer and casual players. While playing this I dipped back into some earlier entries for some let's play vids and yeah those old games had some magic and I feel like a little bit of that is back in this new entry. Speaking of old magic being brought back. Good lord did this game tap into a very specific part of my brain that used to be active all the time in the 90s. Cruising Blast is the most arcade racing game I have played in years. It reminds me of the OTT thrills of the original series and other games like San Francisco Rush, Hydro Thunder and Felony 1179. The game is a port of the 2017 arcade game of the same name and is such a breath of fresh air. Also, did you know there's still new arcade games that aren't mobile phone ported tosh in actual arcades these days? Me neither. Cruising Blast is a bright, colourful, fast paced work of insanity. It's a bit of a shame it's currently only on Switch because even though that feels like the perfect home for it, I can only imagine how nice this would be on a console that could bump it up to higher resolutions and cover it in a layer of HDR graphical grade effects. Don't get me wrong, it's a visual calamity of the best kind on Switch, pure video bitrate killer for YouTube too, but ooh a PS5 or Xbox Series version sure would be nice. Still, if you want a blast of classic arcade action, look no further than this. Speaking of classic arcade action... Whoa dudes, radical, cowabunga and other such phrases. We all like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? Back in the late 80s and early 90s they were a pretty big deal and have survived many reinventions year after year to all sorts of results that I generally think are pretty good. But the games though, they've been a tad rocky the last couple of decades. Know when they were good though? Back when I was a kid, just like everything else I seem to like. God I say these kids have ruined entertainment for the youngsters of today. Oh yeah, the game. TMNT The Cowabunga Collection is a, well, collection of most of the TMNT games from the 80s and 90s. A really good grab bag of nostalgic hits like the original NES game, 
bona fide classics such as Turtles in Time, and some hidden gems like the free Game Boy games. Seriously, TMNT 3 on the Game Boy is neat. This is one comprehensive collection, with multiple versions of every game. I don't just mean each format the games were released on, but each of the regional variations too. There's modifiers that tweak how the games play and perform, a host of graphical effects for the modern era for you to switch off so you can have nice raw pixels as nature intended. There's a host of behind the scenes materials to peruse too. Multiple games have online play which they recently updated by adding online multiplayer to the SNES port of Turtles in Time, along with a host of other tweaks and features. This is generally one of the best retro compilations in recent years, although I will admit I haven't played that new Atari collection yet and I hear amazing things about that. This collection though, it hits that nostalgic thing in my brain for just chilling out as a kid with friends playing games featuring our favourite team of weird mutant hero pals. Speaking of your favourite team of hero pals... Now here's a game I passed up playing when it first came out in 2021. In my defence the previous Marvel game from Square Enix was absolute balls. The Avengers was a mess of online features it didn't seem to need or want and full of the trappings of those games as a service things always had. Gross. Gardens of the Galaxy though, that game is nice. A fully single player, offline, heavily story driven experience that surprised me with just how compelling it was to play through. There's something about this game that felt fully engrossing in how its world was so fully realised and complete. The way the characters constantly talk and mock each other somehow never gets annoying despite it being almost non-stop. Like they talk the whole way through this game's 20 plus hour completion time and it never gets annoying. Almost nothing repeats and it all feels authentic to what you'd expect of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Despite being a single player game, it is built around what you'd expect would be a multiplayer conceit. During combat you'll be utilising the other Guardians abilities to hold enemies in place, stun them and generally mess them up in a big way. Outside of combat you can get Groot to make a bridge, Gamora to climb to higher ground or make Rocket run into tunnels. These mechanics along with the camaraderie of your allies really sell that the Guardians of the Galaxy are a team that complement each other. Well not literal complements, they mostly mock and belittle each other, I mean it as they work as a group. The game is a tad longer than what I tend to get into when it comes to these sorts of story driven adventures these days, but because it was so much fun and so full of weird space stuff I was fully there for it. I did find one sequence a little tough to handle later in the game in terms of emotional implications, a scene with Peter's mother that makes you do something I'd rather not do as someone who has lost his own mother, but it served the plot and I do wonder how people who haven't lost a parent would feel about that scene. Maybe I should just not get attached to story and characters and be one of those guys oblivious to how art forms can move you. Still, properly fantastic experience, I wish I had tried back in 2021 rather than waiting for it to appear on Game Pass. Anyway, speaking of, I don't know, characters being a bit of a mouthful because the Guardians talk a lot. Here's another game that's had a lot of chat about it this year and it's all fully deserved. I've always liked the Kirby series but in a sort of this is pleasant and nice kind of way. The Forgotten Land certainly fulfills that criteria but man they really did a good job transitioning to full 3D here and upping my expectations for the series. The game feels so spot on to play, there's a subtle auto lock on when you go to suck up enemies and objects that really makes the mechanics feel as fluid as it does in his 2D adventures. The new mouthful mode is brilliantly worked into levels and for the first few hours is constantly surprising and delightful as you see Kirby swallow increasingly silly objects. I've got a soft spot for the vending machine personally. I haven't managed to play through as much of this game as I would have liked but I fully intend to return to this and give it a good playthrough in full. It's such a complete shift in the experience of playing Kirby games that I wonder if they can really go back to the classic 2D for the next mainline game. 
Mario has mostly managed to do that now, but no new Super Mario Bros. game gains as much attention as his big 3D escapades these days, and I've got a feeling the same will be true of Kirby. Also, this game has cleaned up in sales and is now the best selling Kirby game in series. Speaking of cleaning up, Oh my lord, this game. I had seen it popping up on Limmy's livestream clips and I was aware that it had been pretty popular with the streaming crowd. I knew that it appealed to me at a base level because I love games that involve tidying things up. Probably a psychological issue I should deal with in real life, but who's got the time for that? Anyway, it got added to Game Pass and a few weeks back I thought I'd record a let's play of a couple of the early stages, and that turned into a two hour long video. I wasn't even mad. I had a great time just spraying water at comical amounts of dirt until it was all clean. The game is calming and so compelling to play. Seeing everything light up all bright and clean from all your hard spraying is one of the most satisfying experiences I've had since playing Unpacking, or maybe that time I got real good at Tetris. As you play through the game there's this multi-layered narrative involving a missing cat, a corrupt politician and possible ancient cults that you may miss if you don't follow the messages and job descriptions. The game is full of strange little quirky easter eggs and odd details that are there for you to discover, plus most stages have some kind of secret challenge to complete that will reward you with an achievement. One stage has you cleaning a ridiculously dirty public loo, and let me tell you that parallels some dreams I had when I need to pee in my sleep, in a way that's worryingly specific. I've also found myself staring at dirty vans and buildings as I go about town thinking about what nozzles and attachments I'd use to clean them. Honestly, I can't praise this simple game about shooting your watery load all over other people's property enough. Hats off to Future Lab for this fantastic game, which would be my game of the year, if not for me now moving on to speaking of my game of the year. It had to be this, didn't it? Vampire Survivors by Lucas Gallant, aka Ponkle, is one of the most addictive and insanely put together games I've played in a long time. At first glance, this simple looking game doesn't seem like it has much going on. You walk around and your character attacks automatically at never ending waves of enemies. You collect gems which level you up, and each level you can pick a new weapon or buff to boost your destructive power, and good lord, will you destroy. Your goal is, most often, to survive 30 minutes but then you'll start unlocking new levels, characters and weapons. You'll stumble across things that pique your sense of mystery, and you'll be off trying to find new items that will unlock more new levels, characters and weapons in a seemingly endless loop of new things. There's a constant breadcrumb trail of discoveries and events that will keep you coming back to see how deep the rabbit hole goes. Allegedly there is an end game. Don't know if I'll ever see it, but I'm going to keep playing regardless of if I do. Everything in this game is designed to make you feel like you're doing amazing, right from the reassuringly pleasant sound of gems being collected, to the best treasure chest opening animation since that link lad opened a chest once. Despite how chaotic and insane this game gets, despite all the ways you'll find to seemingly break the limits of how much damage you can deal and how many enemies you can kill, this game never seems to have an actual limit. It's a sprite-based, almost auto-playing game that gets so hectic it'll push your PC to its limits. I'm honestly amazed I've never had it crash from the sheer amount of stuff it's calculating and throwing around at once. To add to this, the game has a simple and clean presentation, some fantastic music, one funny bestiary written by Stephanie Sterling, and a wide array of weapon combinations to try that you could easily clock up days of playtime and not feel like you've seen it all. I recently beat a boss that I thought was going to be the game's end point, 
but it just pointed me in the direction of even more stuff to figure out. Vampire Survivors is my game of the year and I suspect it'll be the same for a lot of other folk out there. I know it's been talked about a lot, but I just had to gush a little bit for myself here. Also it's like 3 quid and it's on Game Pass. It's also free on mobile devices, although controls a little bit awkwardly there. Plenty of options for giving the game a try and I recommend you do. Have a couple of plays to let yourself understand how it works and you'll find you'll be hooked for sure. And with that, I shall close out this video. That was 10 games what I played for the first time this year and enjoyed thoroughly. Ok so the Cowbunga collection is a bunch of old games but the collection was new and I liked it. Hopefully a few of these games appeal to you guys. Thank you for watching and sorry for there being such a long wait between MG Recommends episodes. I have one in the scripting phase that's been a bit of a hurdle to get written and hopefully I'll figure it out soon. I felt I needed to do an end of year list to clear my head a bit. Reboot my mind so that I can return to that other episode all fresh. So again, thank you for watching and a big thank you to these Patreon backers who have been real good about how little I've done in the way of recommends episodes this past year. There's a reason it isn't a monthly Patreon. That said, if you like this vid, maybe check out some of my other MG Recommend videos and consider backing me on Patreon as I try to get back into my groove of this. Please do a like, comment and subscribe. Tell me what games you've played for the first time this year in the comments and why you enjoyed them. I'll catch you all next time. Laters taters.